from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C.
good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. For those that don't know me, my name is Nicholas Brown. I'm one of the concert producers here. Uh, and a, a special thank you to Lahan for a fantastic evening. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here tonight for the concert and also for staying for this Nightcap presentation. If you're into Twitter, feel free to use the hashtag Nightcap. Because you can. I'll tell you what, I need a nightcap. <laughs> uh, so we're going to have a basically conversation up here and also start off with some questions from you all. Uh, for the questions, because we are recording this for the Permanent National Digital Collection, please wait for a microphone and uh, please consider your remarks uh, appropriately. <laughs> Whatever, I'm not telling you to say anything in any certain way, just now he tells me. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's start off with a question. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to follow on your um, exposition of the politics of the harpsichord, and I'm wondering whether the um, staunch love of piano is somehow in Eastern Europe. Was that a reflection of overcoming the fields? Is there some relationship between? That's an interesting point. Um, essentially, no. Um, I think you have to consider that basically the piano, in terms of coming into Eastern European musical life, had only come in around 1830, 1840. You know, so Russia was considered a latecomer, really, to Western musical culture. So I don't think there was so much of the piano ingrained as to as to uh, you know, as, to, as to make an inhospitable sort of environment for the harpsichord. I think, if, if, if anything, actually, perhaps the preponderance of the piano was very good for the harpsichord, because it meant that people, had, composers had a completely new instrument to work with. Um, what I failed to mention is, of course, that um, in these countries with these ideological problems with the harpsichord, that um, they wrote some wonderful music. I mean, there's, uh, there's of course, Ligeti, there's the Ligeti works which I, which I just recorded, and I almost died of recording, actually, it was just horrible. Very difficult pieces. Um, that was a joke, by the way. Uh, uh, anyway, not very funny, obviously. Uh, so, you know, there's Ligeti, and there's, um, you know, Franz Peter Goebbels, and there's all the, you know, there's Goreski, who wrote a wonderful harpsichord concerto, obviously Martin who wrote his concerto. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, that's, that is an ideological statement, I think, more than anything. I have a question. Work? Yeah. Harpsichord in the 21st century, which could be the title of a book or something like that. But what what about your approach to being a harpsichordist um, makes you unique in the field? I don't know. <laughs> Look, I mean, the thing is, I'm a musician first and I'm a harpsichordist second. Or I'm a musician first and I'm also a harpsichordist. That doesn't mean I'm embarrassed of the harpsichord. No, I love the harpsichord. Obviously, I love the harpsichord. I wouldn't spend two hours on stage with it. Um, but the point is that it's an instrument, it's a beautiful instrument, uh, and it can express all kinds of things. I mean, I think to think of the harpsichord in terms of sort of what it is lacking vis-a-vis -vis the piano is uh, it's just unreasonable. You just have to listen to the instrument and listen to it played well, or played mediocre, I guess. But, you know, basically you have to listen to it to realize what it can offer. I mean, there are no complaints in the 18th century and the 17th century that the harpsichord is sort of deficient. You know, as such, I mean, one remark by Couperin that, oh, I wish you could swell tones, but as you heard tonight, I mean, we can do diminuendos and crescendos and all sorts of things on the harpsichord. Um, and actually, the piano was invented and not even touched for 70, 80 years. So I don't think the issue was that the instrument went obsolete. I think that aesthetics changed. And, you know, and people, people came to, to prefer the piano. But the funny thing is, of course, the invention of the piano uh, as a part of intellectual history is very... Uh, it's a very important uh, thing to consider uh, in the sense that when the piano was first invented, um, the piano was invented essentially as a result of uh, a lot of discussions amongst learned academies in northern Italy. And um, they wanted to find an instrument that was quiet, <laughs> unlike that noisy harpsichord. I'm serious, this is really what the proceedings of this research you know, say, this is the proceedings of these academies, that they said that the early piano, they said, well, it'll 
it'll never work in a harpsichord, it'll never work in a concert hall like a harpsichord, but, you know, it could be a really quiet chamber instrument. And that's really how the piano was conceived. Um, as it happens, the original name of the piano is the clavicembalo col piano e forte, which means harpsichord with loud and soft. So maybe to consider that on a more micro level, uh, in the period between J.S. Bach and then C. P. Bach, there was a lot going on in European society. Uh, what things were transpiring that may have uh, caused their styles to differ, or their approaches to composition? Look, I mean, you want to talk about a book, there's your book. I know, you should write What is going on in these lives? I just want you to reflect that, that there's a lot of change going on ideologically and intellectually in this period. When I say this period, I'm talking about 10 years. I'm talking about five years. So, just a little bit of background, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, so Bach had 21 children. Uh, presumably he was good at things other than music. <laughs> and, uh, well, or he liked them at least, I don't know. But um, it's funny actually, if you look at a Bach portrait, he's what we would call obese. So he liked food. Um, he wrote a poem about smoking. So he liked tobacco. We know he was paid partly in beer, so he liked alcohol. <laughs> And he had 21 children, so he liked that too. And it really makes me reflect, of course, on Bach the human. Of course, Bach is a very earthy person in a culture that really had a problem with this sort of thing. Bach was a very religious man. If we look at Bach's library, and now I'm going to answer your question. Um, if we look at Bach's library, it's quite interesting. It's essentially all theological works. There are no novels. There's no fiction. There's no sort of nothing fun. Everything is basically, uh, what I can recall from the inventory of his library is uh, the Bible, and uh, the complete works of Luther, complete works of Calvin, uh, and then sort of speculative works on theology. Um, remember, theology isn't really considered a science by them, of course. Uh, and um, there's an atlas, and it's an atlas of biblical lands. There's not even a modern atlas in Bach's library. Um, you have to remember that he comes from a world, um, well, of course we think that Bach is so ordered, so we think, well, his world must have been very ordered, and uh, this kindly organist, and you know, look at the faith he had in the world, but of course that's not the case at all. Bach came from a very troubled world. Um, it's not hard to overstate the effect of the Thirty Years' War on German thought of the period. For those who are uninitiated in this, the Thirty Years' War was uh, in the 17th century, from 1618 to 1648, and uh, was basically a religious conflict between Catholics and Protestants, which killed about 50% of Germany. And uh, just to show the sort of things that are going on in people's minds and how this changes the way people think, um, there's a ver verb in 18th century German that I came across recently, which is Magdeburg Um What does Magdeburg Siegen mean? It means to make a Magdeburg of. Uh, Magdeburg was a city uh, during the Thirty Years' War, and it was a city of 40,000, which was considered huge at the period. And uh, imperial troops uh, during the Thirty Years' War occupied Magdeburg, and when the people of Magdeburg didn't give over their possessions, their money, uh, they, um, the commander said that um, the troops had three days to loot the city. And uh, in looting, they killed people, and they killed so many people, the travelers said that for a week, you could journey by Magdeburg and you could hear people screaming. And um, so many people were killed in the siege of Magdeburg that the census of 1632 showed that the city of 40,000 uh, had registered 432 people. And um, they put all the bodies uh, in the river uh, to keep them from rotting. And uh, well, they rotted and poisoned the river. And then it killed several other towns. Um, now, in that city, 30 years later, Telemann was born. Um, you have to reflect that people are thinking about this sort of thing. People start to reflect. They say, well, we just fought over God. Maybe there is no God. Why would God allow people to die like that? Why would God allow
allow Bach to have 21 children and for only seven of them to become adults? Why would Bach take his parents from him when he was nine years old? Why would God let Bach be rejected for almost every job he applied for? So these are things that people start thinking about. Um, now Bach's response to this, and he writes a cantata called Gottes Zeit ist aller beste Zeit, which means God's time is best, which basically means we can't understand what God's plan is, so his time is, is best. Um, you could call him a critic of Enlightenment thought. Now, Bach's sons start to question that. And they say, well, maybe there is no God. Maybe, maybe things aren't what we think. At the same time, um, another war happens, which is the Seven Years' War. This is when Carl Philip and Engel Bach, when Bach's second son is in his adolescence, kills a whole bunch of other people. And then people start to say, maybe this isn't worth fighting. So, you know, at the same time, Bach, now we had this sonata in A minor, right? So Bach writes the prelude and fugue in A minor at the same time that Carl Philip Emanuel writes the sonata in A minor, and Bach starts it, which is to say J.S. Bach starts it like this. Forget the concert. The thing you should really remember 
is that people write music to respond to what they live through and what they live in. And even between father and son, even between uh, two people who share basically the same you know, sort of musical outlook on life, they might share very different views on how music applies to their lives. I think that's very important to, uh, to reflect on that. Thank you. That's brilliant answer. Uh, questions? Yes, sir. Just get the mic. Hi, Mahan. I'm Sean Zdan. Thanks for the invitation. I'm sorry. Phil. Um, are there any contemporary composers, perhaps yourself, who are writing modern writing today for the harpsichord? If so, would you, would you play a piece for us? <laughs> You know, I'm kind of tired, so I'm not sure if I want to play something. I mean, look, I used to have an English teacher in high school who used to say there's a private response and a personal response. And uh, my composition is what you call a private response. But, um, yeah, I mean, there are quite a few contemporary composers right for the harpsichord right now. Um, as it happens, I'm, you know, commissioning a couple of works, and um, this is a very, this is a very, uh, a sort of normal, Normal thing. I think that it's re-entered the musical, you know, our sort of general musical life um, in a really wonderful way. And I think, you know, the word mainstream I really don't care for it very much, but um, it is entering the musical mainstream, um, and, and I think that's really a, a wonderful thing. So, sorry to disappoint, <laughs> sir. Have you considered uh, playing music of Padre Antonio Soler for a change? Uh, for a change? Yeah. <laughs> Look, I have an hour and a half. I can play everything. You know? no, I Not right now, but uh, perhaps on the record. At some point. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, he's a composer. So, yes. Um, anyway, he's asking about Antonio Soler. This is a Spanish monk who wrote about 60, 60, yeah, 60 harpsichord sonatas, and they're just wonderful pieces. So um, yes, I do want to play some solar. Although I must tell you, um, it's more fun for the listener than it is for the player. <laughs> whatever, whatever that means. Uh, sir, in the middle of here, Mike. Uh oh, this is my high school with music teachers. <laughs> Mr. Esmond. <laughs> Whatever it is, I didn't do it. Yes, you, yes, you did. You remember well. Um, I can't claim that I taught him anything about his wonderful playing, but I do have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, because of my ignorance, is that uh, like a stop on the harpsichord that seemed to be like, like a mute. Is that from the Baroque era, or is that a modern addition to the instrument? Right. This is a, let's have some fun, shall we? Um, basically, you may have heard different sounds. Uh, even heard some right notes now and then. Um, so let's let's talk about that. Basically, there are different sets of strings in the harpsichord. As it happens, um, you see that this one has two keyboards. Most harpsichords in the 18th and 17th centuries actually had one keyboard. Um, there are instruments that even had three keyboards, but they're kind of um, they're kind of novelties, really. So um, what you have on this particular instrument is that you have a set of what we call eight foot strings. And eight foot doesn't mean that they're eight feet long. Um, eight is just the sort of reference number that, that, that we use, and it comes from organ uh, terminology. So let's call that eight foot, okay? So we have eight foot, and uh, it sounds like this. You know. and it has one set of you know, quills basically plucking some strings, right? And then we have another set of strings is at the same pitch, but those of you who play guitar, you know that if you pluck a little closer to where the string is tied, going to create a slightly more nasal sound, right? So this is kind of that effect. So listen to the original eight foot. And then, see it's a bit different, right? And then you have a set of strings, an octave above. Now an octave above, we would just divide eight by two, which would be four. So, uh, that's, see, it's an octave above. Now we can combine these registers. So let's say the two eight foot registers push, push the keyboard in. Probably heard that a few times. It's, you see it get louder now. It's hitting two sets of strings, and of course the technique has got to sort of get 
right through those two sets of strings, which is quite particular. And then you can add the four foot, which would be, you see, now you have the two octaves and the octave above. Um, then this one that you said sounded like a kind of lute or something, that's a set of, uh, well, it's buffalo leather, actually, applied to the strings. No, I'm not kidding. Um, and that sounds like this. That's a nice sound. You can use it as a kind of accompaniment and that sort of thing. And then there were some instruments in Germany that had what we call a 16-foot stop, which is an octave below, uh, like on the organ. So that's sort of that roadmap. Um, you had a second, this is a two-part of yeah. boy. Can you come play for the students on Wednesday or Thursday? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Friedrich went to a town and was sort of 
town music director and sort of had a very provincial life. Um, and Friedemann sort of never found a job. He's what we would call today kind of a loser, basically. Um, he was his father's favorite son. He, um, now, there has been a lot of um, revisionist scholarship about this, and I respect it, and I have read uh, a great deal of it, so I know he wasn't exactly a loser. But basically, Friedemann inherited um, a great deal of talent, um, but also his father's lack of tact um, as a person. One of the reasons why the Bachs were never wildly successful because they weren't tactful people. Um, so, in the case of Johann Sebastian, uh, he was not above giving lectures to nobility. <laughs> um, C.P. Bach, of course, there's a very famous story where um, all these composers at the court of Frederick the Great sort of adored the king, and one time the king said to C.P. Bach that he didn't like his music, and of course, that was something was meant to roll off one's back, and C.P. Bach rejoined her with a comment about the king's ears. Um, so, you know, these guys sort of didn't really get that far professionally, partly because of this. Uh, but Friedemann sort of had a sad life, um, seems to have had a problem with alcohol, um, and when he died, uh, he had abandoned his family, and um, the first performance of Messiah in Germany was put on to raise money for his children. So, and in his sort of problems as a person, he seems to have sold off a lot of the scores that his father gave him. Um, so it's kind of a sad end to move to that family. But. Let's try to pick it up with a happy question. Yeah. So the last question was over here. So to my ear, there's a lot of elasticity of tempo when I hear the harpsichord perform Klaus, more so than I sense with piano. And I've always been curious, is that a personal performance practice? Is that historical? Is that a technical issue because of what you're trying to do with an instrument with less dynamic range? Or, and how do you make those decisions? Mm. First of all, I take issue with you saying that it's something that you expect less with piano. I, I don't know what pianists you're listening to, but if you listen to pianists before the Second World War, everyone has a personal style of playing. Um, doubtless, as you were aware, um, Traditions of playing, uh, very, and I say traditions because there are various traditions based on different players in different schools, um, were mostly based on rhetoric. Um, rhetoric being, of course, you know, sort of the art of persuasion and the art of writing and speaking. And um, music wasn't, we always say about music, oh, let it sing, let it sing, but actually, um, most of piano pedagogy, I mean, instrumental pedagogy was about music speaking, and they always likened. Um, the playing of music to the art of oratory. It should come, of course, as no surprise that many of these composers studied law, and in the 18th century, law was the study of oratory. It's the law of, it's the study of speaking. And so um, there are proven um, different agogic, you know, and performance traditions based on how people spoke uh, in different countries. Um, doubtless, of course, that is in the music and the, you know, the sort of of the imminent qualities of the score itself. Um, but, uh, well, the thing is, look, I can say that in the score there are certain clues for agajas. I can say that based on certain treatises, uh, you know, some of which are more or less dubious, uh, in my view. Um, but <clears throat> one thing that I can look to is how people speak. And um, sometimes we speak in a sort of ready stream, and sometimes we stop and start. And, you know, and I'll speak differently different nights and different days, and you know, no concerts, you know, two concerts are going to be the same. Um, and that's a risk that I'm just going to have to take as a performer. It's problematic, of course, but now I'm starting to record, and people want to hear the piece, they hear it on the recording, but I'm never going to speak the same way twice, um, which means I'm going to take some major budget decisions, actually. Um, and that's just risk-taking. Um, something I really respect about the Russian school of piano playing is that amount of sort of interpretive risk-taking. Um, I think that's so important. You know, I think, I think if people expect to go to a concert and hear the kind of reliability that they would get on a recording, I don't know, reliability is pretty boring. You know, obviously you don't want someone to be, you know, close and competent, but, <laughs> 
um, you know, I think it has to be grounded in that in that sort of discursive, you know, sort of conversational style. And, and it may be, you know, now and then that raises eyebrows, you know, or people might not like it. But all the evidence that we have from the 18th and 17th centuries is that the playing was actually highly was actually highly conversational. They said that when Bach played, every note he played was like a discourse. And that when he played a chord that no one, that the person going to the instrument right after he played a chord could never imitate the way he played it. So he had his own personal style. They said that when he played the organ, that with his feet he could do things that people couldn't do with their hands. And um, you know, I think that's talking about one person. We know a little bit about C.P. Bach's personal style. We know about Beethoven's personal style, which apparently is highly erratic. Um, by the way, I think we should note here that uh, there is a connection between Philip Emanuel Bach and Beethoven, um, just to give you an idea of how much C.P. Bach is respected in the 18th century. Um, Haydn and Beethoven both really studied his music, not so much J.S. Bach's music, um, and I think that's quite, that's quite reflective, really, of the sort of the attitudes that music that people had. I hope that answers your question. Great. So, I, I, I meant the last thing after that. Oh, okay. Hey, look, it's, it's going to be both. Um, <laughs> you know what? Someone really wants to ask, why don't you give them one more question? I'm going to go home. So, uh, who wants to? Do? Come on, let's have some fun. Very, very brief. No, not quite. No, I grew up learning the piano, basically. Um, I mean, the harps were wrong. So, you know, there's books on subjects, there's pamphlets on subjects. I suppose that would be sort of one side of the page. But I mean, um, actually, there were, I spoke to a harpsichordist who went to Iran in the 1970s. There were two harpsichords at radio and television. Apparently, they were both smashed during the revolution. Um, that's all I know about the harpsichord. I was that tall, I was that key a lot. I didn't get to talk. Well, I mean, how often do people hear see harps and words? So it's one of those things, really. But, um, one last question. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you, Mark. Uh, a couple quick notes for housekeeping. I need to ask that no one come up on the stage, please. Vaughn will greet guests up in the front. So please, nobody come up on the stage. For the health and safety reasons, don't make me get the police. Uh, and uh, our CPE Pocket 300 celebration continues tomorrow evening. There's a panel discussion at 6.30 in the Wittal uh, with scholars from the uh, Packard Humanities Institute. And then the Academy for Optimistic Berlin will be here tomorrow evening at 8 o'clock. And thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.